I got you. I got you. All right, well, let's pray and get, get started. Abba, thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for your day, your appointed time, your Moedim. And Lord, may we rejoice in this day. May we take the light in it, Father. Be glorified, we pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. circulating. <laughs> hey, at this time, would you turn and find some people that you may not know as well and greet them and, and say hello? Hey. <laughs> Why are you breathing heavy? <laughs> come on, meet somebody. Get up out of that seat, Tom. Come on. You got a temple? Graves the garden. We're going to keep that temple. Goody, goody. Goody, goody. I 
are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Yeshua is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Yeshua is calling. Oh, 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 come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Yeshua. regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Yeshua is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Yeshua is calling
let you wait for a crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Yeshua is holy. It's who I am, cause you're a good, good father. 
It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I am loved by you. It's who you are. It's who I am. It's who I am. In my mistakes what looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength and my story isn't over my story's just begun and failure won't define me cause that's what the father done yeah failure won't define me cause that's what the father does Check your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house Arrival's not the end game The journey is where you are you never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. And failure's never final, when the Father's in the room, I said. And failure's never final, when the Father's in the room. Oh, lay your burden down. Oh, Father's house, check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Oh, you're in the Father's house. Yeah, yeah. Here we go, say, prodigals come home. Helpless find hope and love is on the move when the father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life, and love is on the move when the father's come on singing. Miracles, miracles take place, the sin of cold mind fade, and love is breaking through. When the father's in the room And Jericho was a quaking Strongholds now are taken And love is breaking through When the father's in the room I said, and love is breaking through When the father's in the room And we are, we are in the Father's house. Hey, at this time, we want to do something very special. We want to bless our children. We want to pray a blessing over them. So if someone would grab the hoopah and the young people come forward, we're going to stretch out our hands to you or lay hands on you. And we're going to pray a blessing, a Sabbath blessing on you. And if you want to come stand with these young people, please come on down. If you're a parent or just a friend and you want to come and lay hands on them.
Come on down. Come on, crowd in here. May the Lord protect you. May the Lord protect and defend you. May he always shield you from shame. May you come to be in Israel a shining name. May you be like and like Ephraim. May you be deserving of praise. Strengthen them, O oh Lord, and keep them from the stranger's ways. May God bless you and grant you long life. protect and defend you. May the Lord preserve you from pain. Favor them, O Lord, with happiness and peace. Oh, hear our Sabbath prayer. Amen. Shabbat shalom. You guys feeling okay this morning? Absolutely. Where's Jean? She's not here. I was going to pick on her. <laughs> okay, so my name is Marcel, in case you don't know yet. Um, good morning. Hey. Uh, Kyle. Good to see you. Good to see you. I saw your wife, but I didn't see you. So it's good to see you, buddy. <laughs> um, today, I, um, I want to kind of go over some, some information from our recent conference that we had here. We hosted a conference entitled Treasures of, the Con uh, Treasures of the Temple Conference, and some of you were there. How many of you were there, actually? Show of hands. Ah, a lot of you. Okay. So I'm going to just recap. I'm calling it Three Nuggets of Torah, just three nuggets, just three things that I took away from this that I wanted to make sure everybody was up on because, um, 
as you come into this walk, there are a lot of things that have to be calibrated or recalibrated. There are things that you thought meant this or should have been this way or celebrated that way. Then you come into this walk and you, you get things calibrated and you go, oh, what? that's not what the scripture says? Oh, that's not what, oh. And that's happened, and I call it paradigm shift. So Mike and I have gone down to Orlando four times for this conference. And so this was my sixth time because we have now celebrated it here twice. So it's been six times. But every time I would go down there, I would have a calibration of proportion that would just send me into this fifth grade. So I want you to do the same thing. How's that? So this morning, I want to present just three things that I found interesting that you may or may not have recognized or has been brought to your attention yet, but I want to bring it to your attention so that we're all on the same level playing field. Is that okay? Yeah? Now, here we go. You ready for this? All right. Let's see. Let me give you a little foundation. So at the level of divinity, the house symbolizes the purpose of all reality. That's a mouthful. To become a dwelling place below for the manifestation of God's presence. So the temple represented God's dwelling place or ruling place, his footstool here on earth. Pretty simple. Now, here's the thing. In Israel, when you went up to the temple, you were as if going up to heaven. The, the temple was on a high elevation. So as you travel to the temple, you're always going up. And the temple was the focus of the entirety of Jewish life. So the Jews, their whole life was centered around the temple and the temple's uh, rituals and, and everything happened there. That was, this, that was the internet back then. How's that? Most of the Torah is about what to do in the temple. I didn't realize that. Your Bibles, a lot of the information, the scriptures that are found there, they're telling you how to actually live and operate through the temple. And of course, you are the living temple, temple of the Holy Spirit. So that's my background. Did you realize, and, and I, I was doing some research, did you realize how many times the Lord refers to water? And I knew this, you know, first coming into it. Every time you see the Messiah, you see a couple of things. You see, number one, the number four being expressed. And then you see water. Every time he's there talking to people, there's always a water element. Well, in Ezekiel 43, it says, And after this, he brought me to the gate facing east. Again, this is talking about the temple. There I saw the glory of the Lord of Israel approaching from the east, because that's how you would come into the temple, from the east going west. His voice was like the sound of rushing water. I didn't pick that up the first time. His voice was even like the sound of rushing water. And in Hebraic understanding, water also expresses the idea or concept of spirit. And you're going to see this in the next couple of scriptures. I didn't realize this also from attending this conference. I was told at this conference, or it was, it was presented to me that I needed to study the temple. I never had known this before. But it says here in Ezekiel 43, it says, You, human being, describe this house to the house of Yisrael, you shall say, so that they will be ashamed of their crimes and let them measure accurately. If they become ashamed of all they have done, show them the elevation and plan of the house. So again, this temple was up the mountain of God. It was up the mountain. And so he's saying, show them the elevation. There is something there. It's exits, entrances, it's details and decorations. All the specifications is design and it's Torah or law. All of that is revealed as you study the, the temple. Didn't know that. And so you can observe a lot of things just by studying the temple. So this is all recap, but, you know, when I thought about the Garden of Eden, God Eden, I always thought about it being in a plain, you know, with a nice little pond, still pond off of it, but it was actually on a mountain. The Lord's mountain um, is expressed all through Scripture, Mount Sinai. The Lord came down on that mountain, remember that? And it's more, you got to start thinking about these things as a mountain, because the mountain expresses the throne of God. Here's a great illustration. You remember when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, and they were told to come to this mountain, and the Lord was going to speak to them. There was the, the lower elevation, the lower ground. That's the court. The place a little higher up on that mountain, that's where the temple would be in, in Jerusalem. That's called the holy place. 
And then as you go higher, it's the most holy place. It's the holy of holies. And then that's expressed through Moshe's uh, Mishkan, the, uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness. You have the court all around. You have the holy place, and then you have the holy of holies. And so you got to start thinking about the tabernacle or the temple in the terms of a mountain. There you go again, another way to express I'm trying to show you different ways to express that. The court all around the altar down there, holy place, and the holy of holies. And you, if you remember that story, not everybody could come up that mountain. When they, when they came to the mountain, the 70 elders went up to the holy place. Remember that? But they couldn't go up any higher. So again, there are places um, uh, of boundaries that the Lord sets. It's called Kedusha holiness there are different levels higher levels of kadusha and it says here in, in exodus it says you are to set limits for the people all around and say be careful not to go up on the mountain or even touch its base whoever touches the mountain will surely be put to death so there were limits there were limits where you could go this this to me was troubling i can just tell you right now i'm gonna tell you at the outset this was a uh, paradigm shift for me when i first heard this and I'm going to show you why. So there was in the temple, this, this is a, a relief of the plaque that would you, be, you, you would find. And uh, if you went beyond this sign, if you were like a goyim, a Gentile, and you went beyond this sign, you were going beyond the sign at your own risk of life. There were temple guards. Their job was to guard the sanctity of the temple. If you went beyond this sign... And you weren't supposed to be there, whether you're a male, female, uh, goyim or not. Uh, even if you were an Israelite, but it was, it was an area that was meant only for the Levites, yeah, you, you went there on your own life. And the temple guard didn't play. Can I just say that? Remember the story of Phineas? He was a temple guard. You know what he did, right? You remember that story? Yeah. So these guards, they were very serious about guarding the sanctity of the, of the temple. It's called the encroachment of the sancta. So I, I thought about this in terms of my own house. If, if I didn't know you and you came to my house, if you were a bill collector, for example, you're not coming to my house, first of all. I'm a, I'm a, I might talk to you from the screen. I might open the door and talk to you through the screen. I'm not letting you in my house. You know. And if you're a friend... You're definitely going to come through the front door, cross the threshold. You might come in my living room. And if you're a really good friend, I'm going to take you from the living room into the kitchen. And that's, those are levels of Kedusha, you know. Um, the last place you would ever come into my house if I just met you is my bedroom. That's a place of Kedusha for me. Um, I don't let people just, hey, here's my bedroom. Hey, have, hey try sitting on my bed. No, that's, 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 out, of, that's out of bounds for me. So it's an example in our culture. So you ready for this? Here are the three nuggets I got for you. You know the story about Yeshua was in the temple, and um, these men brought a woman supposedly caught in the act of adultery. Remember that story? And uh, you know there are rules about catching someone in adultery. If you're going to catch somebody, you're going to bring both parties, not just one. So there was a trap set. It says here in John, but Yeshua went to the Mount of Olives at daybreak. He appeared again in the temple court. I never caught that the first time. You got to understand, their life was centered around the temple. Messiah was actually in the temple at this time. Let me just highlight that, all right? So he appeared again in the temple where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. This is a common thing that the Torah teachers would do. They would take a corner, and their disciples would come, or people who wanted to who wanted to learn more, and they would circle around this teacher, and it, there were many clusters. This happened on, on, on the, um, Mount of Olives. You, the teachers would bring their disciples there, and they would teach them. So this was unusual. But it says, the Torah teachers and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught committing adultery and made her stand in the center of the group. Again, according to the Torah, if you're going to catch somebody, you bring both of those parties, not just one. There was a guy involved. If she was caught in the middle of this, where's the guy? This was a trap. Then they said to him, Rabbi, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. 
Now, in our Torah, Moshe commanded that such a woman be stoned to death. What do you say about it? It was a trap. Messiah being the writer of the Torah, I think he knew what they were up to. He knew their hearts. And again, these weren't just ordinary people. These were Torah teachers. These people who knew the Torah. You would think they would have known better than to do this. They said this to trap him so that they might have grounds for bringing charges against him. But Yeshua bent down and began writing in the dust with his finger. I've heard so many scriptures, so many sermons, so many stories about what the Messiah wrote in the sand, wrote in the dirt. Everybody has speculated, you know. And then at this conference, Joseph Good, who's a phenomenal, uh, he's a man who knows the Torah and he knows the, the temple. He says, hey, you want to know what he wrote in the sand? I thought, well, that's kind of brazen. It's a, you want to know? I'm like, like you know? Who, nobody knows. Nobody was there. He goes, oh, no, it's in the scriptures. I said, really? Yeah, I want to know. I want to know where you see this, what he wrote. It's right here in Jeremiah 17, 13. Lord, you are the hope of Israel. You, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust. So all those men who had come there to trap him obviously had turned their back on Torah, obviously weren't following the teachings of Torah. And it says, and they knew this because they were, these were the Torah teachers, will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring, here he is again, of living water. So he's writing their names. I've heard people speculate that before, but I never saw it in Scripture. And Joseph actually brought up a, a Mishnah um, quote also um, that talked about that. But those men knew the Scripture, and their hearts were convicted when they saw what he was writing. And they put two and two together. And he says, let he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And you know, one by one, they all turned and left. None of them could bring an accusation against this woman. Here's the other, number two. <clears throat> You've seen this in your, in your Bibles, in, in Psalms. There are certain Psalms that are called Songs of Ascent. <clears throat> and exactly, Psalms 120 through 134 are Songs of Ascent. But did you know why they're called Songs of Ascent? I did not know. I, there was a time, I know now, but there was a time I didn't know. Again, we're talking about an elevation because Israel... Um, it's a mountainous place, and the, the mountain of God is a mountain, and they're singing these songs because the, the book of Psalms is actually their songbook. We don't have the melodies anymore, but the Israelites knew these songs, and they sang these songs, and they sang them in unison. All of them sang it. As they were going, as they were coming, as, as these rituals were going on, they were singing these songs. We don't have that. We've kind of lost that. Now, if you look at the bottom of this picture here, you see a little pool down there? That's the pool of Siloam. That's the lowest part of the elevation. Right above it, that little town there, that's the city of David. And then above that, that's, of course, the, the, the southern part of the temple courtyard. So you would actually start at the bottom. You can see that. You don't see that? Uh-huh. Uh-oh. See what you did to me? I'm not going to show you that. All right. Down here is the Pool of Siloam, right there. And it's interesting because that pool, in Hebrew, it's the waters of that pool, they're called Yeshua. The waters of the Pool of Siloam are called Yeshua. And when an angel would stir that, that water, if someone was waiting there to be healed, the first person, after an angel stirred that water, they would, if they got into the water, they would be healed. Well, down here is where the pilgrims would come down. So they start up here, the southern part of the gate, come all the way down here to the Pool of Siloam. This is the eighth day of the Festival of Tabernacles. It's called uh, the Water Libation Ceremony. And it's a, it's a full-fledged ceremony. Everybody wanted to be here to see this event. 
And what they would do is they would get um, lulabs, and they we would they would wave them, you know, and to the the six areas, and they would lie in the streets going down to the pool, and these priests would grab a silver pitcher and a gold pitcher. They would fill one with wine and one with water. There's a little something there going on. And they would go down to this pool being led by another priest who was playing a flute. And that the name that was given to that priest, he was called the pierced one. Because a flute is a pierced instrument. If you look at a flute, it has holes in it, and he's playing this flute. I don't know what kind of melody he's playing, but it's the pierced one. You don't think that this is alluding to the Messiah, the pierced one? And they go down in this elevation, and in their minds, the Hebraic mind, when you leave the Temple Mount area, the highest, one of the highest parts of the mountain, you're coming down. It's actually you're going down to the lowest part. In their mind, that's Gehenna. You're going down to this low part down here. In elevation. I wish I could show you, but you can see how that's a higher elevation coming down to the lowest part. So you're really coming down to Gehenna. They go to that pool and they fill the, the silver pitcher with water and they're singing songs and they're going up the mountain. And this is where these songs of ascent come in. They're singing these songs. They all know these songs. And there's a, a rejoicing going on. And again, the the, the the, it's like a Trump rally, you know? <laughs> and, and people are excited. That's a joke, but that's all right. They found, the, they found this road. It's underneath. It was, it was covered over, but they've actually excavated it. And that's, you can see with the, the metal on top there, that was just a, to uphold what's above it, but that's the actual road. Here it is, another picture of it. That's the actual road. And so these pilgrims would, would travel this road. They're singing these songs of ascent. They end up in the courtyard, the temple courtyard. And these, these lanterns, they're like, I don't know, I forgot what Joe said. They're like 40, 50 feet up in the, in, in the sky, and if they're lighting the whole courtyard. People are just excited. These priests, they take the wine and the water, and they go up to the altar, and there are these horns, and in the horns there are these spouts. And I didn't understand what was going on when I first heard this. But one priest would take the pitcher of wine. The other one would take the pitcher of water. And at the same time, they're trying to pour, or they are pouring water and wine into these spouts. And then from the spouts, those spouts lead into the altar, and the water comes out on the altar, the water and the wine mixed together. And everyone in Israel wants to see this. They're crowding in. You can see the people. They're crowding in that courtyard to see this one, this one thing. All of the elders and the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, they want to see this. It's at this very moment. At this very moment, at the climax of this, of this, of this event, Scripture says in John 7, 37 through 40, now on the last day of the festival, what festival? Tabernacle, Sukkot. Hoshana Rabbah, Yeshua stood and cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him keep coming to me and drinking. Whoever puts his trust in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from his innermost being. Who would say that? Who would in their right mind stand up in the middle of this ceremony, which had been going on for centuries, and say these words? As soon as he did, there was an uproar. Now he said this about the Spirit, whom those who trusted in him were to receive later. The Spirit had not yet been given. He hadn't been given up yet because Yeshua had not been glorified. On hearing the word, some people in the crowd said, surely this man is the prophet. Surely this man is the prophet. What do they mean by the prophet? Did you ever think about that? There is something in their minds. They're thinking, wait a minute, who would say that? Oh, surely this man is fulfilling what the prophet would do. Surely this man is the prophet. 
Others said, no, now this is the Messiah. But others said, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? From Galilee? Doesn't the Tanakh say that the Messiah is from the seed of David and comes from Bethlehem, house of bread? The village where David lived? So the people were divided because of him. So there were some that were believing in him. Oh, this has got to be the prophet. No, he's the Messiah. There was a division over this man. Some wanted to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him. They didn't know what to make. There were some that came to believe. Right then, there were people there that started to believe this is the Messiah. No one would say these things lest he be the Messiah. What person would stand and have the audacity to say these things lest he be the Messiah, or at least be the prophet? Well, have you ever wondered why Yeshua screamed those words? I hope you're wondering why he said it. It was perfect timing. They were coming in, everybody's marching, they're waving lulavs, and, and, and this excitement is building, and they wanted to see this water and, and, and blood being poured out because in Hebrew thinking, wine represents blood. So there's blood and water coming out of the altar, of the altar, onto the altar. When during the service, when during the service of the water libation did Yeshua say these words? Right then. Right when everything was climaxing, when they're all in the courtyard, then he stands up and says these things. What was Yeshua giving reference to by using those words? I'm going to show you. And who was there? All the prominent men and women of the city of Jerusalem came. They were all there waiting to see this. Well, the reference to this was found in Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. The Lord said, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among the, their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth, and, I, and he will tell them everything I command. This is the reference of the prophet. They were expecting a prophet. It's interesting to discover that the Jews had always understood that this prophecy would one day be fulfilled in a literal way by the coming of the prophet, who would either A, come just before the Messiah, or B, would, in fact, be the Messiah. The expectation helps explain the dialogue between the Jews and John the Baptist. Remember that? They were testing John the Baptist. In John 1, 19 through 21, when they asked who he was, he said, I am not the Christ. Oh, who are you then? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? They were asking. No. Well, then, are you the prophet? No. When they said the prophet, both the Jews and John the Baptist understood the reference to the prophecy of Deuteronomy 18. They were expecting this prophet that the Lord would raise up for them. And they were questioning John the Baptist. Are you the prophet? Are you he are we, that we've been waiting for? Are you Elijah? Are you the Messiah? This is what was happening in, at the end of uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. They were saying, surely this man must be the prophet. Or maybe he is the Messiah. Let me put a pause on that. Let me show you just a couple of scriptures about how the Messiah is related to water. John 4, 10, Yeshua answers her. This is the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. If you knew the God's gift, that is, who it is saying to you, give me a drink of water, here's that water theme, then you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Hmm. John 4, 13 through 14, Yeshua answered, everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I will give him will never thirst again. On the contrary, the water I give him will become a spring of water inside of him, welling up into eternal life. Are you thinking of other scriptures now? When Messiah said this thing? Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 12, verses 2 and 3. Behold, yod heh vav -Heh is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. But yod heh vav -Heh is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. I find that very interesting. He has become my salvation. Because in Hebrew, the name Yeshua means God is my salvation. And he has become my salvation. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. There's this water element here, this illusion of water. In the mission, it says, anyone who has not witnessed the rejoicing of the libation water, well, if you haven't seen this, this whole imagery of this ceremony, you, you haven't seen it. That's why the people were crowded in there. 
I, uh, you know, I, I've come to understand that the Mishnah is important when you're doing research because a lot of times the Bible, the Torah itself doesn't tell you how to do something, but the Mishnah does. So it's important when you do research. Zechariah 13.1, in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanliness, uncleanness. A fountain open to the house of David. There are many scriptures that talk about this. Isaiah 44, 1 through 3, it says, For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. There's something about the Messiah and water. And of course, water was essential in those days. Jeremiah 2, and this is where I, I was just reading earlier. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And then I read already Jeremiah 17, 13. That's where he was writing in the, in, in the dirt in the temple. Numbers 20, verse 8. Take the rod. You know this one. This is when the children of Israel were out in the desert and they were thirsty. Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aharon thy brother, and speak ye to, unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth its water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. Water, water, drink. All about water, water, and fountains and springs. And Moses and Aharon gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. Ooh, big mistake, if you know the story. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. I won't get into why. Isaiah 55, 1 and 2. Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. And I, I think about, I think about heaven, and the description. It talks about a city, and there's this river of water, and on either side of this river, there's these trees that bring forth fruit. And again, we are free to drink of this water. It's life-giving water, coming from the very throne of God. So there's so many scriptures I could have, I could have brought to you, but I'm just giving you a couple. <laughs> there's so many. I, I'm not going to stop. I'll, okay, here. In Revelation, and he said to me, it is done. I'm the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the waters of life freely. And then in 22, 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whoever will, let him take the water of life freely. That's all I'm going to say about that. I was hoping Gene was going to be here because Gene had, uh, this is Daryl's wife, Gene had uh, come to me and asked me about the temple and, and, and the uh, veil that was torn. Now, as a worship pastor, growing up, um, I sang a lot of songs about the veil and going beyond the veil, going into the Holy Holy. I'm going to show you some of the songs I used to sing. Well, this was my recollection that the veil... In the holy, going into the holy holies, that's what was rent. I believe that because that's how I was raised. That's what I was taught. And then I went to this Treasures of the Temple conference, and they threw a wrench at me. So the question was presented, which veil in the temple was rent? Anybody want to take a stab? That wasn't there? <laughs> which one? Well, Fran, I mean, Jean, Jean, Jean France, she was asking me before the conference, Marcia, what about this? And I was like, oh, you're going to find out. You're going to find out. And in case, in case you weren't there, here's what's going on. Look, look at this. Here's a model of the uh, temple. 
Can you see right out here? That's a veil. That's going into the Holy of Holies. This is the court all around out here. That's the court. And then you go up these stairs, and that's a veil. You see it? That's going into the holy place. So the question is, how many veils were there in the temple? And Kyle already said it. And it's alluding to the fact that in the, in the Mishkan, in Moses' tabernacle, the movable tabernacle, before you went into the tabernacle, there was this linen uh, wall. And, and there was this gate called Beautiful. The first gate you saw was this beautiful gate. It's interesting because the gate of the court, it, it, was, it was arrayed in a certain way. There weren't any cherubim on it, but there were, um, it was heavily woven. It had blue, purple, scarlet, and um, that was indicating the universe, the cosmos. That's what that gate was. It wasn't signifying you're walking into the Holy of Holies. The, the gate or the veil that was going, and I can't even call it a veil because this was a thick, heavy woven macrame kind of, you know, thing that if you had 20 oxen and you put them on each side to try to pull this thing apart, it wouldn't come apart. It's, it's, a, it's a thick thing. Well, when you walked into Moses' tabernacle, there was a gate, beautiful. Then you went into the holy, you went into the court all around, and then there was the brazen altar, and then there was the laver, and then you went into the veil again. That's the veil going into the holy place, all right? So you don't think that the the temple in Jerusalem, Solomon's temple, would be made after this? Uh, I would think so. So there were no cherubim represented on this outdoor screen. Cherubim were only seen on within the holy place. But this is the imagery I used to have, that inside the temple, the veil before the Ark of the Covenant tore. That's what I was raised in. That's what I was taught. This is a side view of the temple. This thing was two stories high. This thing was humongous. It took, I don't know how many um, Levite priests to open the doors. And that first one, where it says A, here, this is the front of the uh, coming into the temple. And then there's a door here behind it. So this veil is just one veil. And again, this, these things were, I don't know how many stories high. This, these things were huge. And then there were... There was another veil, actually two veils right here. They just have B, but there's actually two veils. I'll explain this in a second. And then upstairs, there was another veil. So there were actually four veils. Now, let me explain how this works. If, if this is the, no, I'll do it this way. If this is the holy place, I wanted to go into the holy of holies, there would be a veil that's attached to that door, and it comes all the way over here, all right? And then there's another veil attached to that door, and it goes almost to that door. So the priest that go into the Holy of Holies, he would come in, go around the first veil, go all the way down, and then finally end up into the Holy of Holies. So if one of those veils tore, there would still be a veil covering the Holy of Holies. And so the question is, which veil tore? Well, it would be that veil. Kind of messed up my whole theology and my song repertoire, too. You can see it again here, being depicted. There's a veil in front of that doorway. Very costly veil, but it didn't have any cherubim on it. It had blue, scarlet, purple, indicating the cosmos. How much did they, how much did they say? Oh, that was that beam that was holding it, yeah. There was a beam. There was a beam up here holding this veil. And the beam itself was like 14 million. It, it, it was hollow and it had a piece of gold. They had molten gold in there and it was holding that veil. Um, that's what rent. So that was a game changer for me um, because I remembered these stories about Aharon's sons, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu. Remember they went in and they offered up some strange fire, and fire from the, from the uh, Holy of Holies came out and, and subdued them. Can I say that? Subdued them? Killed them. 
Each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized, there's the word, unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. This devastated Aaron, Aharon. He was devastated by the loss of his two sons. And I think about this concept. Do you, have you ever sang this song? I used to sing this back in the, in the day. Come into the holy of holies. Enter by the blood of the Lamb. Come into, it sounds great, doesn't it? It sounds beautiful. Come into the holy of holies. You might die to write that if you weren't authorized. And let me tell you, the only person who could come into the holy of holies was the high priest, and that was only one time in a year. Now, he might have gone in there four times on that one day as part of his ceremony, but it was only one person and one time. And our God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what makes us think we could, we could enter into the Holy of Holies? <sighs> that hurt my heart because I love that song. It was this song. I enter the Holy of You know, you've heard. We sang this here, right? I enter through the blood of the Lamb. I enter to worship you only. Okay. I can't sing the song anymore. I've had to retire the song. I can't enter the Holy of I'm not the high priest. You understand what I'm saying? And, and I think in our, in our ignorance, we want to go into the Holy We think that the way into the Holy of Holies is now made open. No, there's something called kadusha, encroachment of the sancta that's still in play. And I remember going to Jerusalem and hearing some of the Jews, they would not go up on the Temple Mount. They refused to go up on the. They refused to go up on the Temple Mount because of respect for Kadusha. Because they don't know where the these places were, and they were afraid of walking into a place that was barring them. It was not open to them to walk there, and I have a new respect for them. It's like oh. They're not just being religious. They're respecting the holiness of God. Uh, if you walk upon an area, you know, when it was standing, there was a danger of you dying from walking into a place unauthorized. And even though the buildings are not there, the holiness of God is still there. It took me a while to understand that. Here's one that got me. Ugh, I love this song. Take me past the outer courts, through the holy place. Pass the breeze, and they, they're given the whole structure of the of the courtyard, and 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 even Mish, you know, the uh, Mishkan. Lord, I want to see your face. Okay, so then it gets to this part. So take me in to the holy of holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. Mm mm. Mm mm. There's a Phineas waiting for you to come out. Come in there. <laughs> you don't want to come into the Holy of Holies unless you're authorized, unless, the, unless you are the holy uh, uh, high priest. It's called, again, encroachment. I, uh, I love this movement. I, I love the fact that we are um, learning so much. And we, we're having to unlearn some things. That was the most painful thing to me coming into this movement, unlearning things. Because, again, I thought, yeah, we had free access to the Holy of Holies. And I had to unlearn that and respect the holiness of our God and realize, no, that's, that's, not, that's not for me. He has made it possible for us to come into his presence and all through the temple there are certain elevations and some of the ways that you knew that there was a change in holiness kadusha was that there would be steps and as you went up from the women's court for example there were steps and there was a higher level of elevation and then when you went into the the court all around there were these places where only the levites could go and there were 15 steps that you had to ascend before you went into the holy of holies, and you don't walk up there unless you're a Le Levitical priest. You just don't do it. There is a, 
There is a holiness that the Lord possesses that we need to respect and be in awe of. I know I am. I have a, a higher level of, 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 of respect for the holiness of our God. And I pray that as we continue to learn these things, uh, I, I, I pray that our love and respect for our God will increase as well. Amen? Let's pray. And Brian, you can start making your way up. Abba, thank you for your word. I, I, I appreciate Joseph Good and Rico Cortez and Ryan White coming and sharing what they have discovered. There was so much more. But Father, bless them for bringing this, this knowledge to us. They'll be back again next year, Father. I pray that more of us will make an effort to attend, to learn more about you. It's all about learning who you are, Father. And erasing some of the wives' tales and theories that men have come up. Father, you've said clearly in your word how we are to approach you, how we are to worship you and revere you. And I pray that we would attain wisdom in how to do that. Be glorified in our midst today, I pray, Yeshua. You are the high priest. You are our counselor. You're our God. And we need to respect you as such. You are the creator of the universe. May we humbly come before you, Father. May you be glorified in our midst always. I pray these things in Yeshua's name. And all of God's people said, Amen. I got to say something before I do the blessing. Um, Mike just mentioned that we have <laughs> um, some work to do yet on some cabins, and uh, we have a work day tomorrow. I'm, can I make a personal plea that we have a good turnout tomorrow? Uh, Mike won't do it, but I'm, I'll do it in his, in his stead because this guy is going to kill himself. I got on this case yesterday. I called him. Um, and I know many of you have um, obligations, and some of you are working two or three jobs. I get that. Um, could we make could we make a honest? Uh, can we just try to be there tomorrow? I'm pleading because I mean I go. I'm not much uh, much help. I'm, I'm relegated more to a gopher right now. I, I just don't have the strength to, to be out there. Um, but I, I was able to give, you know, Don a, a wrench. So even that spared him from coming down off the, off this truck that he was using for elevation. So if we could come and enforce and help, um, I'm just afraid that Mike's going to run himself in the ground because he's just a, that's just how he's wired. But we need your help. Can I just say that? He won't say it, but I'll say it. We need your help. All men and women on deck, whoever wants to come help. I don't care if you're a man or a woman, please come. All right? Is that all right? And God's people said, okay. Lastly, um, what I wanted to end on with my um, teaching today, the water, the blood, it was realized and manifested when Messiah was on the tree. When the Roman guard stuck him in the side and water and blood came out. And he was that altar. And because of him and his sacrifice, we now can be called the children of God. And it's found in Numbers 6, 22 to 27. And this is the ironic blessing. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, speak to Aharon and his son, saying, thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, would you stand for the blessing? Yevarecha, Yahweh, Vish Merecha, Yahweh, Yahweh, Vnabelecha, Vichunecha, 
以撒亚维，巴拿哈瓦勒哈，维亚什勒哈，勒哈，舍罗。Then in English, may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make His face shine on you and show you His favor. May Yahweh lift up His face toward you and give you His peace. It's shalom. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach, Shahar Shalom, Hu Adonai, in the name of Yeshua, the, the Prince of Peace, you are Lord. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Before you rush out, we are having Oneg, which is a fellowship meal. Um, our servers are already prepping everything. So just give us a few minutes and we're going to have a meal together. You did not have to bring anything. Just come. And if you want to talk to me about the message or Mike about the message or Brian about prayer, and if you need prayer, please come on up and we'll anoint you, all right? Thank you for being here today.